So most of us have a driver's license when you're driving down the road. It's important that everybody follows the law. Pretty much without exception, if everyone follows the law on the road, there wouldn't be any car accidents. People would stay on their own side of the road. Right of way would be given to those that have the right of way. People would stop at stop signs. Think about that. If we all obeyed the law and were conscious of the law and paid attention when we were supposed to pay attention all the time while we're driving, accidents would diminish, crashes would diminish quite a bit. Think about that in a spiritual sense. What if all of us decided that, um, not through our own power, but the power of Christ working in our lives, we were going to obey all of God's precepts, all of his commandments? What kind of world would we have? So putting the law in that perspective, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? Think about the laws where you live. We live here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. You know, the law does not give me life. Life comes from God. It's a gift. But does the law here in the Commonwealth of Virginia help keep me alive? It does because it keeps that guy coming down the road towards me in his car on his side of the yellow lines. And hopefully, if I'm paying attention, it keeps me and my car on my side of the yellow lines. And that helps preserve my life and his. It's interesting when you think about these simple things. How does that pertain to the law of God? The law in Virginia can also condemn me to death or take away my life. It can take away my freedom. If I think that I'm above the law and I make choices that justice will have to correct. So the law, no matter whether it's a civil law or God's law, First and foremost, it's for order in these jurisdictions. No matter if it's the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth of Virginia or the jurisdiction of God, which is all of the universe. It's for order. It's for fairness. It's for justice. But like I said, the law doesn't give life to me. God gives me life and sustains my life. Here's what the psalmist said right at the beginning of all the psalms put together in Scripture. Psalm 1, 1 to 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, or standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is the law of the Lord. And in his law, does he meditate day and night? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. It's interesting that David here uses an analogy about a tree planted next to the river. It's always got enough water. We're going to be like that if we meditate on the law of God, his precepts, his guidance and direction. Not just the words written down on ten, in, in ten precepts on tables of stone, but the principles behind all those things. Do we take those things into our hearts? So meditate on his law day and night. <clears throat> I just finished in my daily reading, reading through the book of Galatians, and now I'm on to Ephesians. 
So maybe this is partly where this came from. But I always have enjoyed the book of Galatians. It, if you really dig down and see what Paul is saying, it has everything to do with the balance between understanding where salvation comes from, how the law of God can work in our hearts and minds to bring us closer to God, and God's justice is seen in his law. Galatians 3, 21 and 22. Is the law then against the promises of God? So the promises of God, the promises through Jesus Christ, is it against those things? And the King James says, God forbid. If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should be by the law, right? I would obtain righteousness by adhering to every one of God's precepts. But that isn't how I live righteously. Verse 22, the scripture has concluded all under sin. Or this means that all have sinned. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You see, righteousness is given to us by the grace of God through the faith of Jesus Christ. It's a gift. If it's by the grace of God, then it's a gift to us. We can't earn it by keeping his law. So what's the proper role of the law in my life? I think that's really important. A lot of people just want to sweep God's law away. It doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't have to keep the law anymore. Christ came to do away with the law and all that. There couldn't be anything further from what the Bible actually teaches. I've highlighted these things in the verses I've just showed you. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So righteousness is not by the law. So why keep the law at all? If we don't get righteousness by the law, I can do what I want. That's the attitude of many people today. Does that work well with most of your relationships? <laughs> it doesn't. Think about it. In the relationships that we have where we love our family members, our spouse, the people that we interact with, does an attitude of, I can do anything that I want, I can be as selfish as I want, that, that just doesn't work. It doesn't work with God either. And he knows that it won't work for humanity. Let's turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. When I was putting this sermon together, it just seems, seemed to flood into my mind all the scriptures that I could go to. And this is one of the ones that came to my mind, and I just thought, <clears throat> this is really Paul's experience I can identify with, his experience. I'm not going to start, I don't think I'm going to start at the beginning of the chapter. I'm going to start in verse 12. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. And Paul says, Wherefore, the law is holy, the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by, by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. I had to have a knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. God put these things in my heart. He's trying to write the commandments in my heart and in my mind so I'll understand that the things that I choose selfishly are sinful. Verse 14 says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, 
sold under sin. Yeah. There couldn't be anything more opposite, right? That my deceitful heart is against the commandments of God. Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do, that do I not, but I hate, that do I. There's a war going on inside each one of us about what's right and what's wrong. I don't know about you, but I feel that every single day. There's something. Even if I go through one of those days where I I just get in my car and go to work and I'm just going through the motions trying to do what I need to do to get through another day. There's always something, some moral decision that comes to my heart and my mind. Are you there with me? Verse 16, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me. He's saying, what choice do I have? What choice do I have? I'm I'm a sinner. I, I really don't have a choice. That's what he's warring with. But he gives the antidote. Let's not forget to keep reading. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that is good, I find not. In other words, I'm I'm willing, I want to do what is good, but how that's going to come out of me, how every time a moral decision comes up that I'm going to make the right decision, I don't know how to perform that. I don't know how to do that. The selfish will inside me gets in the way. He says again in verse 18, how to perform that which is good, I don't find inside me. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that's what I do. It's almost like it's programmed inside of us. He goes on, verse 20. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present in me. He's saying that there's a default to the human heart born in a place where we're just ready to do selfishness and ready to do sin. That's the default location of the human heart. Verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I can see that these principles God has given me in his scripture, those are awesome. I wish I could do them. I wish everyone around me would do them. No more killing, no more stealing, no more lying. We wouldn't be lied to anymore, and we wouldn't take an occasion to lie to anyone else. We'd treat everyone with love and respect, and we'd put God first. He delights in the law of God. Verse 23, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And then he says, I'm in a rough place. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? You have to admit, even with this attitude, Paul's in a pretty good place. Because now he's looking for help. That's where God wants us to be. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus, through Jesus Christ, our, lo- our, lo- our Lord. So then with the, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. 
I got things right in my head, but they just don't come out when I try to do them. So I can't leave the first part of chapter 8 out because he says there's no more condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. That means what I do. I'm not walking after the things in my flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So the answer, the answer is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That makes us free. Christ makes us free from our own selves, from myself. He makes me free. That's really what he's saying. The law is really important, isn't it? Because it teaches us about the righteousness of God in a practical way. But what Paul here is saying is there's something much deeper than just the knowledge. How do I overcome the world and myself? I want to go back in Romans a little bit to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Remember, we're talking about the law, how that pertains to life, okay? Romans chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse, in verse 10. Romans 3. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. <laughs> Doesn't leave any of us out. There is none that understand this. There is none that seeks after God. And this is a direct quote from the Psalms, uh, Psalm 14. They are all gone out of the way. They are all, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shred blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth will be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And I... I know what you're thinking. I'm, I'm thinking probably the same thing that you all are. Well, this really isn't me. My mouth is really not full of cursing and bitterness. My feet doesn't really, it's not swift to shred blood. And uh, destruction and misery, I'd rather not have any of that in my life. And we make excuses about our character to ourselves. That's the big problem. But remember what verse 19 says. These things are recorded so that every mouth will be stopped. That's my mouth. I can't look at it any other way. And all the world may become guilty before God. And the footnote says, subject to the judgment of God. How, how do I get out from under that? Well, we just read that there's freedom in Christ Jesus. There's freedom to do what is right in God's eyes. That's right living. That's righteousness. What's right in God's eyes? Not in mine own eyes. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That puts it in perspective, doesn't it? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What does that mean? The righteousness of God is is manifested. In other words, it's, it's made tangible in our lives. 
being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, there's a way to obtain righteousness without the law? Well, that's what it's saying. But it doesn't mean we disregard what the law is teaching us. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Christ, by the faith of Christ Jesus, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You mean we obtain righteousness by the faith of Christ? What he did for us? And not by the deeds of the law. Well, here we are again. We're at a point in scripture where a lot of people would like to say, well, why, why should I worry about anything that I'm doing then? Why should I can be concerned with these things? But we can't just stop reading. It says, being justified, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that it is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. In other words, God has set up Christ Jesus to be the sacrifice for us. To take the blame for what I've done. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. So Paul asks, where is boasting then? Is it excluded? By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So it doesn't do any good to show people, look what I've done. I'm a righteous person. Because if I obtain righteousness by the faith of Jesus Christ, it's not me. It's Christ that works in my heart. He gets the honor and glory for any righteousness that is shown through my life. Therefore, we conclude, verse 28, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That's how we're justified. So God doesn't really care about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis then, does he? That couldn't be further from the truth of what we're reading. It's just that God has made it so there's no way it's me that's done it. It's Christ working in me. This is what this is trying to teach us. It's not trying to teach us to throw away the law. Verse 28 again. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not of the God of the Gentiles? Not, not also of the Gentiles, yes, of the Gentiles also. So what Paul is trying to say is, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, where you live on this earth, you can be a child of God by faith, and you can do righteousness by the faith of Christ Jesus. Seeing, verse 30, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. It's the same way, no matter what our background is. No matter if we've been in church all of our lives and learned all these things or not, God wants to bring us to a place where we're putting our faith in the faith of Christ Jesus. Do we then make void the law through faith? Here it is. God forbid. We establish the law, it says. We establish the law by our faith in Christ Jesus. How do we do that? By right living. By recognizing every precept in God's law should be set up in our hearts, saying, look, God has given me the power to do this through his son, Christ Jesus. It's God who works in me. I don't want to go to the Gospels now and see these teachings in what Jesus taught. So I want to go to Matthew chapter 22. 
Matthew chapter 22. Did Jesus really teach all this stuff? Are are he and Paul on the same page? That's, That's probably a dumb question, isn't it? Matthew chapter 22, and I'm, I'm going to start right at the beginning. I like this parable. It has to do with what we're talking about. And it's really good for us to look at the whole context. That's why I'm starting at the beginning. And I think it will be evident by the end of the chapter that Christ is trying to teach the same things that Paul is trying to get across to us. Matthew chapter 22, And Jesus answered and spoke unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and had treated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready. But they were which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Wait now, let's just stop there and think about who Jesus is saying this to so we can put it in kind of context. He's He's preaching this to the Jews, the nation of Israel, and he's saying, look, you've been called, you've been called by God, and you refuse to do what God has asked you to do. You refuse to be his people with your whole heart. He's going to call other people. He's going to call other people. Verse 11. Don't you think this would be a little offensive to the Jewish people, especially the Jewish leadership at this particular point? Pretty offensive. And when the king came in, verse 11, to see the guests, he saw that there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. We've read where we get righteousness from. It's by the faith of the Son of God. It's by the faith of the Son of God. So what's Jesus trying to say? to all of Israel, but especially to the leadership. He's trying to say, hey, look, you search the scriptures, basically, he's saying, and you set up this religion, but you won't come to me, is what Jesus is saying, so that you can have life. So this next section of scripture, they try to trick him. They try to say, hey, should we pay taxes or not? And if he says the wrong thing, they're going to trap him. But he says the perfect thing. Because he's the son of God, he knows what to say. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. That's verse 21. And then they try to trap him again. It doesn't seem like they're on board with this faith in the Son of God thing, right? They're trying to continually trap him. They try to trap him again, talking about this woman who was married seven times and what's going to happen in the resurrection. And again, Jesus gives the perfect answer. He gives the perfect answer. 
Let's go down to verse 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, imagine that, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What an answer. Because you can sum up all of God's precepts in loving God and putting him first with all your heart and then loving your neighbor as yourself. You can sum them all up. It's true, right? What if everyone did that? <clears throat> so look at the context of what we've read in this whole chapter. Jesus is rebuking them, their lifestyle. They won't come to him. They would rather try to obtain righteousness through their religion, through law. And now they're trying to trick him and trap him. Where does he point? Let's take a look at the rest of the chapter. While the Pharisees were gathered together, verse 41, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Now, let me tell you, I look at this like he's giving them an opportunity. They know that Jesus has said he is the son of God. They know that. He's giving them an opportunity to say, you know, our righteousness is going to come through the Son of God and confess that. But they won't do it. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. It's a trick answer, really. Because it's true but it's not the whole truth. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord, that's Jehovah, said to my Lord, that's Adonai, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? You see, Jesus is trying to point to the way, the truth, and the life for these people who will not turn to him for life. No man was able to answer him a word. Why? Because they wanted to stay in their selfishness. Neither does any man from that day ask him any more questions because they knew what they were choosing. Here, here's the text I've been quoting, John 5, 37 to 40. And the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. These are Jesus' words. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. What, what a rebuke that is to the leadership in Israel. And verse 38, and you have not his word abiding in you. That's obvious, isn't it? For whom he hath sent, him you believe not. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they. The scriptures are the things which testify of me, Jesus says. You will not come to me that you might have life. Let's not make the same mistake. We can get caught up in the law. We can be in this ditch and think about the law all day long and the do's and the don'ts. We can be in that ditch which throws out the law and says, I can do whatever I want. 
But we have to recognize that life and the righteousness that leads to life comes by the faith of the Son of God. And in that faith in the Son of God, there is power to do the righteousness that God wants us to do in our lives. If you want to call that law keeping, that's fine with me. But it's God's standard and not ours. Uh, I want to keep going in Matthew chapter 23. And um, I don't have in my notes where I was going to start here. I don't have in my notes. But I just want to keep reading, I guess, at the beginning here of Matthew chapter 23. Then spake Jesus to the multitudes, to his disciples, to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not, do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. And lay them on the men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge their borders and their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at the feast and chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the market. And to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. What's the principle that God is teaching us through these words of Christ. That righteousness is not of ourselves. It's about humbling our hearts and allowing Christ to move us to the place where we can be acceptable to God. That's what I read from these things from Christ Jesus. He goes on. <clears throat> this, this is really where I wanted to read here. In verse 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to, ye to have done and not to leave out. The others undone. What Christ, Christ isn't sweeping away the law. He's saying they've paid so much attention to the little things. Why didn't they pay attention to the things that really matter in people's lives? Like judgment, mercy, and faith. So I'm asking each one of us, myself included today, how does that line up? with pointing at me. What do I do in my life? Am I worried about the law too much? Am I not worried about the law at all? It's got to be right in the middle. Let me turn to the PowerPoint. Again, this is what Jesus said. John 5, 39 and 40. You search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. But they are they which testify of me, and you will not come to me that you might have life. So like we talked about at the beginning, even here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the law is a good thing. It keeps me on the right side of the road. Keeps everybody else on the other side of the road, as long as we're paying attention. God's law is a good thing, but
but it doesn't give me life. I'm going to go to Galatians chapter 3, where we were reading where our scripture text came from. And I'm going to start in verse, I think it's maybe 20, Galatians chapter 3. And I just wanted to read a few verses. It's 21. Galatians 3, 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded, all of us are under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. What does he mean by that? He means, he's talking about the covenants. He's talking about how they were given the law in the Old Testament. It taught them things. It teaches us things today. But even under the Old Covenant, it was faith in God's promises that was counted to them for righteousness. So in verse 24, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. You know what? We're under the headship of Christ Jesus. Let me ask you. Do you think Christ is going to teach us anything that is contrary to the law of God? Absolutely not. We just have a personal teacher. We have a comforter who wants to teach us righteousness. Verse 26, we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as been, have been baptized into Christ have Put on Christ. That's talking about his righteousness. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So how do we obtain life? Is it by law keeping? No. How do we obtain life? We come to Jesus Christ. And he teaches us how to be righteous. Here's my final text today. It's from 1 John. 1 John 5, 10 through 12. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. It's time to look to Jesus. It's time to turn away from our selfishness and invite Christ into our hearts every day.